Hello, everyone. Hope you can hear me well. Um, I am. Uh, um, I'm without a camera today, so uh, let me know if uh, if it's all good. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, welcome to our fourth week of the EPF study group, and uh, after uh, covering the intro, the execution, the consensus layer. Um, now uh, we will dive into how all of this that we discussed actually gets tested and secure. Um, this is very important uh, for many people. The testing sounds uh, like something strange. Like why why should we care about it? It's just like part of the development, but it's actually one of the most important parts of the whole Ethereum. I would say as important as the topics as we discussed before, because well, this is what prevents the whole network from uh, going belly up, as we say, and. Um, for this week's talks, we, we got the, the, the best possible person to discuss this topic, and it's Mario Vega, our co colleague from EF Testing and Security team, uh, who have been working on the testing for since like autumn 2021, I believe, um, a year before the merge. And during this first year, he, well, he overhauled a lot of the testing infrastructure, which helped the merge to, to, for, for the merge to actually happen and till today he is one of the the major forces behind all of the testing of the upgrades and hard forks and so on so yeah i'm i'm very very happy to have mario here today uh are you with us can you can you hear me hello can you guys hear me yeah yeah all good Perfect. yeah thank you so much for joining you can you can share your slides here in the yeah. present button um, Give me just one second. And uh, yeah, for everybody listening, joining in now, uh, please use the week four in the um, in the study group uh, Discord. We just opened, uh, we just opened a thread for this week's presentation, so you can ask questions there. Feel free to ask anything during the talk, and uh, we will um, we will try to get it answered uh, either within the within the thread or or uh, we will ask Mario directly. So, yeah. Yeah, and we got the slides, awesome. Does that work? Does it look okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. just okay, uh, let me... Can... Yeah, of course. Um... You can just click on the slideshow if you're looking for that on the right. Yeah, the big the button. Right, there you go. Yeah, that one, there you go. <laughs> awesome, thank you awesome. so much. Yeah, so... The stage All is right. yours. Go ahead. Ah, oh, perfect. Um, so, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, my name is Mario, Mario Vega. I'm from the EF. I work in the EF testing uh, team. Um, I focus mainly on uh, developing the tests and the functional, ma ma mainly the functional testing part of the entire testing setup that Ethereum uses to actually work properly. Um, so I'm gonna dig in a little bit on what I, I do and a little bit of what of uh, some of our peers in the EF do, um, mainly testing uh, security also, and also a DevOps a little bit of, of that. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So today's topics I'm gonna be covering, uh, how is the execution layer testing done? Um, mainly the EVM testing, um, which is a very important part of the consensus of the chain. Uh, we have two main repositories for this. Uh, one is the Ethereum tests, and the other one is, is a near one we, we, we just started working on. It's called the Ethereum execution spec tests. Um, and we're going to cover a little bit of that. And I'm also going to do a little bit of a, a demo on how to run these tests, how they work, and their inner workings um, uh, is going to be really, really good. Um, the I'm, I'm gonna cover just a little bit of consensus layer testing, um, mainly the Ethereum consensus specs, which is the repo that basically does everything. Um, it's a w uh, one solution for the specification and the testing. It's all covered in one in, inside of this repo. I'm gonna just go over it a little bit, uh, not in the greatest detail because um, this is not the, the main area that we work currently. Uh, I mean, the, I, the EF team, uh, the, the testing team. Um, I'm going to be going over a little bit of the cross-layer interrupt testing, uh, which is a very important part now that we have two layers, the execution layer and the consensus layer part. 
Um, and I, it, 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 the team, the EF testing team works mainly on Hive, uh, but we also have the DevNest child works and testnet, which are the uh, work of the DevOps team. Um, and we're gonna cover a little bit of that, but we're going to go a little bit deeper on on Hive, which is uh, um, the the one that I the, the, that I I work with the most. And we're gonna do a little bit of a demo in, in that too, how to run tests, uh, how they work, the inner workings, and all that stuff. And finally, a little bit of the security, uh, what the potential issues are. Um, what are the rewards if you guys uh, are into finding security issues? Uh, what can you earn if you uh, if you if you disclose properly and you find uh, any security related issues? It's uh, that's gonna be what we covered today, and also how, how to publicly disclose share this after uh, any security incidents has been has been uh, addressed. Um, so yeah, we're gonna start with the uh, EVM testing, uh, which is, mm, I, I wouldn't say the simplest, it's very complex, the, but the setup is is the most straightforward. Um, EVM testing is, the main purpose is basically just to try to verify that every single Ethereum execution client adheres to the specification. This is extremely important because not adhering to the specification means a possible potential fork in the in the chain if there are not, no consensus on what um, what was executed through all the transactions. Um, it's the, the setup is super simple for for even testing. Basically, you have um, the same input uh, for every client, and you must register that every single client uh, gets the same exact output given the same environment, pre-state, and hard fork activation rules, uh, which we'll be going over in a little bit. Um, yep. So yeah, I wanted to cover just uh, this important characteristics of a test because these are like the most, <laughs> the, the things that we um, focus on the most when writing our tests for the ABM. And the first one is um, the pre-state. Um, and I'll, I'll go back a little bit to so just just explain a little bit uh, of, of how is this composed. So the blockchain, uh, the Ethereum blockchain contains uh, the state. Um, in general, this is where everything lives. Everything that, that comprises the Ethereum blockchain, it's, it lives on the, on the state. This contains the smart contracts, the balances, the nonce, uh, the code of the smart contracts, the um, uh, and also, most importantly, the storage of the smart contract. So every single smart contract um, contains at least code and storage. This is a very important part because when you're writing your smart contract, um, you normally want to save some information uh, that will uh, be preserved even after. So even after the first transaction where you launch your smart contract, on, on the next transactions, you will want to access information from the previous ones. So this is the storage. This is a very important part of the of the blockchain. And when we set set up uh, the EVM testing, um, this is like the the, mo the most pivotal part of the of the of the test because um, we don't test uh, the entire mainnet, for example, because it's huge. Uh, what you have right now in mainnet, you have like contracts that have. Uh, an insane amount of storage, an insane amount of uh, key values that they will uh, use. For example, Uniswap, they use like a lot of um, a lot of the storage to store every single user's, uh, um, for example, balances in each token, and so on and so forth. But for the for the the simplest testing, so normally when we write an EVM test, we we normally just want to focus on a a small, a small slice of what the EVM executes. So for that, we generate the pre-state. The pre-state is something that we know for sure is going to be before we execute any of the transactions. Um, and this is very important. I will explain a little bit further in in, in the following slides. Um, but that's the gist. And um, yeah, the another important part of of this is the environment. So. Um, when you are running your transactions, your transactions are in the blockchain are, are surrounded by 
first of all, more transactions, but also an, an environment uh, which is the block. The block contains a lot of information that can affect the outcome of your transaction. Uh, for example, uh, you can read the timestamp of the of the block that you are currently executing on, or the preferred DAO, which is something that comes from the consensus layer and gives you some pseudo randomness as input to, to your contract. Also, the block number, for example, that's very important. You can also get previous block hashes. Um, as well as, for example, a total gas limit. If you want to limit how much your test executes, you're going to set up a smaller or bigger gas limit. We have some tests where we bump up this gas to a very large large number just because we want to, to check if um, any, any contract takes too long to execute, for example. And also the base fee, because the base fee is it's very important because even if you are not uh, executing uh, something that um, something that requires a lot of a, a big uh, transaction fee, you still want to make sure that every single client um, takes the base fee and, and calculates the correct fee for every transaction that you are testing for. Also, the hard fork activation times. This is very important also because when we are testing um, for a new fork, the most common setup scenario is that we uh, set up a, an environment where the fork is going to be activated at some n blocks in the future. Um, this is in, in the, uh, I'm going to give a very, very specific example. In the case of the blobs, for example, you are not supposed to be able to run blob transactions before the, 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 Dan the Cancun fork is activated. So in the environment for this specific test, we set up a fork activation time in the future, and we then we send the transaction, for example, and then we verify that the block containing this transaction is correctly rejected by, by, the, by the execution clients. Um, this is just a small example, but there are a ton of ways where you can um, test a lot of interesting uh, combinations and activation uh, scenarios with this with these variables, and that's that's why the environment is very very important for the um, for the for the preparation of the test. Um, and the the third one, this is the transactions, right? Is that this is basically the most most important one. Um, if you don't have a transaction that you're testing with, basically you're not going to execute anything. Every single execution of a smart contract starts with a transaction. So this is a very important part of the um, of the test that we write. Um, most likely, when you're writing a test, you are sending your transaction to a smart contract that you know it's going to execute some important piece of code. Uh, you're never going to send just like a transaction just to send either from one account to other because there's nothing interesting going on. Um, but yeah, you're going to set up um, with the help of the pre-state and the environment, you're going to set up a an interesting transaction where your uh, your execution of this transaction is going to cause something interesting in the blockchain. And that's how your test will work. Um, I say transaction and transactions because we have different kinds of subtests. I'm going to go into a little bit more of detail, but basically we can have um, tests where just one transaction is interesting for us. And this is to test very specific EVM executions um, in, the, in, in, the, in the chain. And if we also have a test with multiple transactions, which equal equal to a, a block filled with many transactions. This this is when we are going to test the full blockchain fun functionality. And lastly, um, but not less important, is the post state. Um, when we are designing a test, uh, it's very important that after you, um, you, you, you set up the pre-state environment the transactions, you also want to know exactly what you are expecting uh, to happen in the accounts to the, uh, of the blockchain. So for example, if you set up a smart contract and this smart contract is supposed to write something into the storage of, of the smart contract, you expect a zero to go from zero to one, then this is a place where you're gonna put that in the post-it. Um, the post-it contains all the list of the interesting accounts that you're calling with your transactions and also all the interesting storage values uh, that you want to check after your transaction has executed. Um, very important. And it's also very important to know exactly what to look for. Um, when you're writing a test, 
you are not writing a good test unless you really know what the outcome should be. Um, and uh, yeah, this is part of the of the setup and the and the and the, and the, and the verification basically at the end of the execution of the test. I will I will go into a little bit more of the detail on how uh, we use all these inputs to generate a test and how we verify against the clients in a little bit. Um, I don't know, Mario, if you have um, any questions so far. If not, I can just con continue. Yeah, OK. Um, so all of these inputs that we have into the, into the EVM tests, they are meaningless unless we have something to execute with them with. So this is a process that is called test filling. So once we have written all of our inputs, we have the the state that we want to execute. The, we, have the, we have the smart contracts that have the correct code and everything that we want to execute. We still have to somehow apply the, the state transition, which is the moment where you convert the, the, the pre-state and the transaction into a post-state. And this is, this is a process that is done in many different ways. Um, but it is important because the when we have a, a, a test, we have test source code, which is uh, write, written in JSON or Python, depending on the on the repository that you're using. But um, the output is always going to be J, a JSON output. That that's what we use, um, and it's going to be consumable by every single client. Um, and this is this is a process called test filling. This this is a process of converting the, the the test design definition into something that is actually consumable and verifiable in each of the clients. Um, very important process. I'm going to explain a little bit in the in the following slides how it is specifically done, how we do it, and yeah, um, yeah. Oh, also uh, more important, um, this process of filling is is very different from the unit testing that is performed um, by all the clients. Every 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 piece of code um, can do their own unit testing. Uh, this is a very common practice uh, when you're developing software. And they the Ethereum clients do use uh, unit testing to test their uh, the execution clients and the consensus clients. But the important quality of uh, a test fixture that we have filled is that this can be consumed by any client. So we generate a test once, and then we can execute it across all of the clients and verify that none of them have any discrepancies between them. Um, this is very important to keep the consensus running. If we relied on writing unit tests for every single of the clients, the, the unit tests would definitely be different. So when we are filling a test and we create the fixtures, it means also that we are sure that the, that the the execution client is consuming exactly the same test. This is very important for consensus. OK. Um, so yeah, let me see. Yeah. OK, so this is uh, a small diagram uh, which shows just the just the gist of how um, we do a single state test um, in the in the in the for the EVM testing, and we start with what what I already described is the pre-state. You have all the smart contracts, all the balances, and the code, and the storage that you need for 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 your for your test. You combine that with a single transaction, which has a an account source. Uh, an account destination, some value, which could, could be either zero or something, some gas, and some data. And when you combine that, you will get the post date, which is possibly create, creation of new smart contracts, some modified balances, some new or modified, co uh, well, not modified code, new, new code or modified. Uh, yeah, this is incorrect. <laughs> no, not modified code, it's impossible. Uh, new code. Or modified storage, yeah, that's it. Um, and um, sell the structs and all that stuff. Um, you can have everything of that. The important part is that on the pre-state, uh, you can um, you you have to set up a smart contract that 
perform some interesting things. Um, and, and that's that's going to be the destination of your transaction. Otherwise, it's not going to execute anything meaningful, and you're not really testing anything. Um, also, the transaction, for example, if it's possible that the uh, the destination of the transaction is no, not a smart contract, but the creation of a smart contract, that's also possible. And then the, the, the data that you put in this transaction executes in the way of init code. So that's also interesting. So if you can um, put um, some interesting init code, it's, 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 it's another way of testing that your smart contract was created in the correct way. And the also the, the, the modified balances, the new created code is very important here also, and the modified storage if necessary. Um, most importantly, we use what's called the state root to make this verification. Um, and the state root is, as we explained earlier, the state is what contains the smart contracts, everything. But the root is like this cryptographic computation and that commits and securely commits all the contents of the state into a single number. So it's, it's a very big number, basically 32 bytes of information. That is very difficult to have two different states that commit into the same uh, in, into the same number. This is what makes uh, the blockchain secure. And so, given that um, that precondition, we can assume that if two execution clients we, you give them this, the, the same pre-state, the same transaction, you also can know that uh, you expect the same state root difference at the end. If you compare two execution clients and they give you two different state roots, that means one of them, uh, or maybe a test also, it's incorrect. And this is the way that, we, this is the simplest uh, way of testing DVM. We also have, um, Fuzzy differential test state testing, um, very similar. The main difference is that um, we have a tool uh, which is called Fuzzy EVM, uh, which is written by, by one of the uh, developers of the Go Ethereum client. And the way that this works is that instead of having a an a known smart contract um, that we designed to hit some sp specific uh, code path in the execution clients. In this case, the the, the fuzziness comes in in the way of how uh, what the code contains. So you write uh, you let the 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 the, the, the code being fast into the into the lock into the pre state of of the chain, and then you create a transaction that specifically the destination is that code is that false false uh, false smart, smart contract. And then. Um, since we don't know exactly um, what the outcome of that, uh, that contract will be because it's fast, um, it's, it's going to have very uh, stochastic or random uh, behavior. You're going to maybe set storage that you don't expect to set. The way that we verify this kind of test is that we pass the state route to different uh, and we compare that between different clients. So if we have the same fast, fast smart contract, the same transaction, the same pre-state, and we get a different state root on 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 two different um, EVM clients. That means there's there's a mistake. There's something going on. And then you can verify and see exactly um, by examining examining the trace of the execution to know exactly what what happened. And then you can find uh, bugs uh, this way. Um, yeah, and we also have uh, well blockchain blo blockchain testing so the previous ones were based on we have like a pre-state we have a single transaction and we have a very very specific execution that's going to happen and we but we also can have a full block testing which means that you also have like the pre-state which is the smart contracts balances code and storage and whatever and you put them in a genesis um, that you are going to instantiate your blockchain with then you start feeding blocks, each one with transactions and also header values and also more information that comprises the block. And then you start feeding the entire block into the execution client. And then you expect that after one or two or many blocks, you expect that the client, if, um, if, if your outcome of the validation is, is that every single block 
that you feed uh, into your test, that, that, that you designed in your test is supposed to be correct, then the expectation is that the execution client consumes all, all of these blocks and you, you check uh, the, the chain head of the execution line, you must find here the, the block that you expected it to be. If for some reason, uh, let's say in this, in this, in this diagram, uh, block number two was deemed invalid by one of the execution clients because they had a faulty check somewhere, that means that the chain head is not going to correspond to block number two, and then you got you get an error. Um, this is very important because um, not everything that we check on the execution clients is part of the EVM execution. We also check other values that are resulting uh, of the of the execution of previous previous blocks. For example, um, 1559, which is the base fee. Uh, you have the um, the base fee of the block. And this is calculated based on previous transactions of the previous block. So if there was some client that had a faulty calculation of 5059, the base fee, then you will get a rejection somewhere in here, um, for example. And then your chain head will not uh, match to the last block of, the, of, your, of your test. Then you can you, you, you will you will have found a, a bug. Then you also check uh, the ball state, the new smart contracts, the modified balances, the new code, the modified storage, everything. You check that everything is in place after, even e because even after consuming correctly consuming all of the blocks up to the up to the end block, you could still have some bugs somewhere where the the storage for some reason do, does not respond correctly uh, from the from the execution line. That's that's very very. Uh, it is, is, is not very common because normally when you check the chain head, you also checked the state root, which means that the, 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 the cryptographic commitment that we talked about previously. Um, and that means that you have your storage correctly. So these kinds of checks are, are just sanity checks, extra checks. But yeah, the basic gist is that um, all the blocks were consumed because the client is correct. Um, yeah, so and we also have the 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 other um, uh, the other the other way of of, of checking, which is um, that you design your test with one invalid block at some point. Uh, for example, let's take the example of the fifteen fifty nine again, which is uh, let's say that you deliberately put an invalid value into the into the base fee of a block. And then you feed that block to the to the client. Then you expect the, the 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 client to reject this block. So what will happen is that the block, the block gets rejected. That's one check. Then you go back into the client and you say, okay, what was the last block block that I gave you? That was correct. Then you check that again because in this case it's block number two. That was the last block. Then you check uh, deposit and everything. Um, and, and here the posted becomes important because um, if you if you feed any an invalid block, you expect that the um, the 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 post state or the, or the contracts living in the in the in the client are not belonging to to the invalid block. So in this case, this this check is actually more important. Um, it's also very important to know exactly how the client failed. Um, it's very important where when you are designing one of these negative tests that um, that the that you are you are completely sure that there's no other way that the client could fail. For example, if okay again, if you are designing a test for fifteen fifty nine and you want to put an invalid um, value in in the base fee, but you forget to update the block hatch. With this modified value, with this modified value, it would mean that um, that the client is still going to correctly correctly reject your block, but not because of the base fee value that you modified, but instead because of the block hash. So that's in, in, an invalid test because you didn't make sure that every other field what you were testing was was correct. So if you have, um, so th this is very important when when, you, when designing a test. And you you have to always make sure this is something that um, that it's it's very easy to slip in here to 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 
to write the test and then you think in your your you cor correctly wrote your test and then realizing later that uh, okay i didn't change this and the, the the client was passing the test but there was a faulty uh, a fault somewhere that i didn't detect because the client still rejected the block because my block was not correctly designed my my test was not correctly designed um yeah um any questions so far um there is a discussion going on maybe guys i i will give you a second if you want to ask a question but otherwise it's uh, pretty clear thank you so much mario it's it's great um, right. People were discussing like uh, mm -hmm. just some stuff I was able to answer. Um, yeah, I think I think we'll get to questions later. All uh, right, all right, cool. Okay, so now to the test, to the actual test filling part of the of the tests. Um, we're gonna start with the first. Um, with the first uh, repository that we have. Um, this is the Ethereum test repo, which has existed since, since the inception of the Ethereum uh, almost nine years ago. And this is um, the first, first test filling uh, framework that we that that was produced by the uh, by, by, by the Ethereum community. It's basically the, the, the source files of uh, of the tests are uh, simple JSON files and or YAML. Which is the source code of this is the part where you um, where you design your pre-state, your storage, your code, your smart contracts, everything you put it in there. This is this is all goes into a JSON file um, or a YAML file. Um, it provides very simple parameterization um, in the sense that you can set up multiple transactions to operate on top of the same pre-state, and then you expect a different outcome depending on the transaction and then you can also check all that uh, uh, in 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 the in in a, in a in a compact json format and these tests are written in um, in c++ uh, no, i'm sorry the, the the filler the test filler is called retest it it's calling re in in it's written in c++ um the, what retest it is basically you have your your J json input you have retested, and then you call retested, and then it consumes the JSON. It calls um, Go Ethereum actually to fill the test, and then at the end you have a fixture that every single client can consume. And then you can check uh, for invalidity in any of the um, any of the clients. And we have the uh, newer uh, execution spec test. This was just developed. Uh, over the over the, the course of last year and the the, the previous year also, um, the main difference is that we have Python source code. So the source of the tests, this is the where you define your pre-state and everything. This is all in Python, and it provides simple to complex parameterization because it's powered by Pytest. So we have all of the Pytest tools uh, are at our disposal to make different parameterization of different tests. Um, and uh, this allows a lot of flexibility um, and it's very efficient on just writing a single uh, input and then you just pass a lot of parameters, a lot of, a lot of values for the parameterization. It will generate a ton of tests for you. It's really, really convenient. It's um, It can get really complex. So uh, we're still defining, we, we're still at that point where we're defining how much how much complexity do we want the tests to be? Um, so uh, it's 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 really nice. Uh, it, it's a really nice framework overall. Um, the downside is that as retested, also this still also requires um, an actual client implementation to be able to fill the the the, the, the tests because of the transition function. Um, this is only because we don't have the transition function implemented in Python so far, but there's a work in progress to have um, the entire Python um, um, specification um, written in, in a project that is called EELS, which is the Ethereum execution, um, execution layer spec. 
and this will in the future be, will be used to serve as the actual client implementation, um, but not today. Okay, this is the this is the these are the inner workings of how the execution spec test. This is very similar both in retested and execution spec test. So I'm going to go um, over this, this point um, on how it works internally. It's very simple, actually. It's um, the framework, as I, as I said earlier, it starts with some Python tests. Um, and this, this test, you can create one for every single EIP or several for several EIPs, or um, you, can, you can write many for many forks, for example. Um, the way that we're working right now is that we have uh, different folders where our Python tests live, one for every every fork. So for example, we started from Frontier and we go all the way up to Cancun. And Cancun at the moment contains all of the 4804 tests, all of the uh, beacon root contract tests and everything, all, all of that. It's uh, very well organized. Uh, I re some, this is something I really like from, from the new repository. And you start from that. You have a you, you start with your Python tests where you write all your pre-state, your transactions. You uh, you actually have like um, uh, the written the parameterization or everything, and then when you execute this, to execute this, what it's used is the fill command that we have in this repository. Um, you specify the fill command to what tests you want to execute at the moment, and then it will go in execute the Python code. And the important part is that it has two dependencies, well, three. The, the, the bottom one is a little bit less important, but the two ones on the, on the top are, and especially the top one is very important. So when you're filling tests um, and you, you get to the point where you want to execute a transaction, but you don't know how to do this because you are running Python, you don't have the, the, the actual logic of the, of the execution client. What you do is you spawn up uh, this, uh, go through subcommand, which is called EVM. And then um, EVM transition is actually EVM TA10. What you give to this command is just the all the pre-state uh, and the transactions and the environment. And then it will, it will spit out what the result of the execution is, including the execution of every single transaction that you, that you gave it. Um, this is important because it's a very back and forth uh, process filling tests, if you have one single test that executes 10 blocks, you will be calling this EVM transition, transition tool 10 times. Um, it's, it's, it's very efficient. It's, it's not, uh, it's, it's not it, it, but we have like another, more solutions in the way to make it more even more efficient because we basically call once, two or three times every single test. So it's it, it gets quite consuming, quite, quite CPU consuming. Um, the second uh, dependency that we have is uh, Solidity. Um, and this is less so because most of our tests uh, inside of our framework, we have every single opcode that the EVM has. And um, so you don't really need to write Solidity and it's, um, so it is an, an excellent uh, language to write the smart contracts, but the problem with us is that we normally have to focus on single opcodes that we are testing. So in the case that Solidity makes some optimization to what we are expecting to see in the opcode, in the, in the, in the bytecode that goes into a smart contract, that is not good because if it, if it optimizes out some um, very important opcode that we are actually testing when we are filling that test, it's going to make the test uh, unreliable. It's simply not going to work because the, the opcode that you're testing is not there, it's not executed, it doesn't matter. Um, so, so we only use Solidity when we have very complex uh, code that we cannot uh, do with bytecode writing. And it's not actually bytecode writing, it's, uh, I, will, I will show an example in the source code uh, in a bit just for you guys to see how uh, how we write this. But yes, it's, it's, it's less and less used by us. Um, we also have the other input is um, the EIPs, um, the repository actually. Um, we th This is the primary source 
of the specification that we use to write the test. So whenever we are writing a test, we don't go to the EVM, uh, to the Go Ethereum's code, we go to the specification. And from that, we pull out the test cases. We, we actually write them from the specification. So it's very important to pre pre preserve uh, the, the, the ideas of the, of the EIPs in the, in the, in the, in the source, code, source, code, source code of the tests. And the way that we do this here is that we also, well, one is the, the tester, the test writer. They are going into the EIP and they, they, they are copying or bringing or whatever the, the, the formulas, whatever that, that is describing there. But also they bring the, um, the checksum and the version of the EIP. And this is important because um, during the development process of any fork, it's really common that the EIPs change uh, from time to time. So this is like a safe measure that we use to make sure that, okay, we pulled this logic or information from the EIP or this idea from the EIP. Um, are we sure that we are working on this new newest version? Because then the EIP changes and then the execution client goes and implements a new version and our tests start failing. And they come to us and say, oh, what, what did you write? Then we have a like a, a proof that we wrote for the EIP, but at a previous version. So then uh, the, the process there just to go update to the newest version, but then we have fail safe here um, just to make sure that we are writing for some version of the EIP. Um, yeah, after the fill command is executed, uh, we get the output, and this is this is the important part. Um, these are the fixtures. This is a very simple. Well, it's not <laughs> very simple JSON file, but it's very readable. Um, and there's nothing complex in the JSON files. It's basically just the output of the of the test. And there are two flavors. It's the well, three three flavors. Is the state test, uh, which is the first um, first one that I described over here. The state test we have a format specific for this. And we have another format specific for this. And that third format is, which is this same format, the, the blockchain format, but we that we use to consume in Hive, uh, which is a tool that I will explain a little bit further uh, in, the, in the presentation. And yeah, the important part here is that this is the actual input to the clients. And this is how we test the clients because the client goes and consumes this JSON. And if it finds some uh, something that it's that it could not consume, or when it consumed it, it found a different result. That means there's a difference. There's a there's a there's an error somewhere, and this is how we find the bugs uh, in the clients, at least for the EVM part of the testing. Um, I will explain a little bit further uh, the in in the in, in the presentation about Hive, and uh, but the the gist on why we need it is because there are always two methods of consumption of the blocks in every single execution client. So one is the um, the raw format. You have the the block, the actual block, which is um, formed into RLP, which is an encoding method. And this gets broadcasted through the peer-to-peer -peer network. So you, when you're syncing, this is what you're getting. But in the other case, when we use Hive, we feed uh, the, the execution client via the engine API, which is the engine API is basically just a method of communication between the execution client and the consensus layer. So when when the the actual Ethereum blockchain is running, we have the the consensus client running and it's giving instructions back to the execution client. So those instructions are in the form of the engine API directives, and this is what we test here. So when we are filling the tests. The high format contains the actual engine API directives that are going to come from the consensus client. So we can be sure that um, we, this uh, this specific test scenario is going to be tested as is as if it was running on the real blockchain. Um, taking into account the difference that come from the the fact that mainnet is very very large in state terms. Um, and all of the tests that we feel that they are very, very small state because otherwise it wouldn't be manageable. But yeah, it's more or less the same thing. Okay. So yeah, um, I wanted to give a little 
demo on how we actually fill the tests. Um, let me go to first. Let me go to the to the actual repository. Uh, by the way, can you still see my screen? Yes, all good. All right, perfect. Um, this is the execution spec test uh, repository, and it's very nice, nicely documented. We have this documentation um, page here that you guys can come and see. Um, the first, um, we need three th three things um, to to run this. Well, and the prerequisite that you need Python installed. You need Python three point ten, um, I think. 3.10, yes, 3.10. And we also need to have compiled EVM and Solidity. So I'm not, I'm not gonna go over how to compile Go, uh, Go Ethereum and, or, or Solidity. You can assume that it's very, it, you go to the readme and in the Go Ethereum repository and you can, you can compile that. But yeah, the first approach is that you come to this repository and then you can clone the entire repository. Uh, just git clone, this and you can get a copy of this in your in your pc um and let me just show you what the repository looks like um yeah this is this is this comprises the, the repository is comprised by two let me just there you go the repository let me delete this oh, yeah and we have two sections of the repository. The first one is the source code of the framework. Uh, so everything that you find in, in inside of source, it belongs to the code that we use to fill the tests. There are no tests here for the Ethereum uh, blockchain. But And then the second part is the um, tests, also in the root directory. You can start seeing here that you actually start to see some hard forks. So we have every single hard fork until Cancun is over here. And we start from Frontier. And then uh, Homestead, Byzantium, Istanbul, uh, Persh, uh, the, the Merge or Paris, uh, Shanghai, and um, I, I skipped London and Berlin. But yeah, you get, the, you get the idea. So if you go into any of these folders, you can see every single test that we have implemented. Uh, just take into account that this um, this repository started being ad active and since, Sh since Shanghai. So for Shanghai, yeah, you will see every single AIP. But for example, for Berlin, you will not see that many because um, it was not active when Berlin uh, came to be. So you will not see all of the full set of tests. Those will, you can find them in the Ethereum test repository. So yeah, let's take a look at just the simplest test <laughs> that I can think of. As, uh, let's go to the to one of these tests. And uh, yeah, let's start from the from the from top. Um, every single test that we write here uses PyTest. Uh, we, is a framework that we use to uh, to fill our tests. We use a lot of the functionality that PyTest provides for us. Um, and then you can see that we need to write uh, functions for each of the tests that we want to, to, to provide. In this case, we have this very simple test that is called uh, test dupe. Its purpose is to, uh, as, as it is stated here, is to test uh, the dupe opcodes, which are one of the most simple um, opcodes that exist in the EVM. Uh, it tests dupe one through 16. So it will generate one test for every single uh, dupe opcode. Um, yeah, you can see here really nicely how you can, uh, you have the num, um, uh, you, you can see that the uh, the actual meaning of each of the of the uh, of the of codes, but yeah, uh, this this test function it generates one status, the one that we talked about uh, earlier, the first one, and the, the reason being is that this is purely an EVM test, so uh, you can abstract everything away that that is on the block, and you can stay only with the um, with the with the opcodes and the EVM execution, and then you get this test because it's the simplest. You you don't you don't require anything from outside to test the dub, dub command. Um, that's that's the main thing uh, to keep in mind when you're deciding which which format you're going to test with. Um, yeah, you you get an environment um, and you get the pre. This is the pre that we have been talking about. So 
the first thing that you have to do is yeah, you have to um, you have a common test address, which is the source of all of our transactions that we that we write. And this pre, it will contain all of the code also, but it's not filled here. So at this point, we only set up a a test address, which is the source of the transaction, and we will have an, an unlimited amount of balance because this is this will be the source of all the transactions that we send. So it has to have something, right? Um, <clears throat> then we define the, the account, um, the account, uh, the, where we are going to put the code that we are going to work with. This is the main account where the transaction is going to be sent to, and then it will. Um, it, it, we are going to start creating the code on top of it, um, which is this. Let me see if there's anything else. Okay, yeah. So yeah, and as you can see, it's there are three parts to generating this code. So the first part is that um, we're going to create um, uh, 11, uh, 10, so from 0 to to 10, to no, 0x10, which is uh, 16, um, push commands. So this is very easy. It's just the push command is um, basically just push something into the into the EVMS stack. So yeah, the EVMS is stack computer. And then you use the stack for a lot of things. So the main uh, EVM opcode that you're going to use ever writing a test is at least some of the push commands. So in this case, we're using them. Um, we are using the, the simplest one, which is just push one byte code, byte, one, sorry, sorry, one byte into the stack. Um, the stack is comprised of 32 byte uh, elements. But in this case, we're just pushing one byte. So it's going to be. Um, 31 zeros, uh, 31 zero bytes, and then one one byte, which is defined by this. And if you know Python, you know now that we are going to collect all of this. Uh, we, we're going to collect this uh, this array or list into a byte byte code that is going to go here. After that, we're going to put our uh, opcode in te uh, that is um, under testing, which is. Um, which is defined this variable. And this variable is special because we define it as the parameters to our test, as you can see here. And also it's important because uh, this is what is being parameterized. This is one of the most important uh, decorators that we have for, uh, that we use from ByTest. Um, basically just take this, this, this parameter that is gonna be used down here and then run this function each time for each one of this. So, this the, the value of this variable is going to change on a, in each iteration that this function is executed. So uh, on, the, on the first iteration is going to use the dub one, on the second dub two, and so on and so forth. And this that is going to change which value, uh, uh, which value of the bytecode is executed, and then therefore it's going to change the outcome of the of the of the of the test. Uh, lastly, you we're going to use another of the most important um, opcodes that we use, uh, which is the SS store. And um, uh, the, the SS store is, is basically the most used opcode for us because this is the way that we save the stuff into the storage of the contract that we're executing in. Um, if we don't use this opcode anywhere in our tests, it means either that we um, are testing something else like an error or something, or we have written an invalid test, <laughs> basically. Um, and in this case, we're, what we are doing is like we already have all of these things in in the stack in the in the stack over EVM execution. Then the last step is just to save them. So that's what we're doing here. We're pushing just one one uh, one more byte into the stack, which is where we're going to save this value here that we that we that we pushed previously. And then store it, obviously. And we're going to do that for every single stack item that we have, which is uh, one more. No, it's the same. It's the same. Yeah. And that's that's going to be stored when we execute our code. Um, lastly, we have our account set up, which has its code, its address, and everything. So we are ready to just put it into the pre-state, which is which means that when we are execute this test and the client consumes this test. It's going to find a pre state that contains the account. So that's very important because it's how the transaction is going to be executed. And 
it's the destination of the transaction, as you can see here. Yes, exactly. So the transaction that we produce in this test is a single transaction. Uh, and the only thing that it matters here is that we are sending it to the to the account where we put the code that we were writing. Um, uh, plus our information, but this is not relevant. Um, yeah, basically. And also, lastly, the, the last thing that we're going to set um, is the post date, which is what we're going to check that happened after the the uh, that happened after the execution of the transaction. Um, basically, it just expects that the the stack items are in the correct position that we stated here. Uh, if you read the description, you will find out how, how it works. Um, but yeah, this is basically the, the last step. The next step is just filling test. Um, what will happen here is that uh, we're going to fill the status with all of the ingredients that we set up before. And it's going to give us a fixture. So the easiest way just to do that is going to is going to be that we run the fill command. And so where are we is important. So test frontier opcodes test underscore dub dot pi. Let's do that. Fill fork uh, Cancun, let's say. And tests uh, frontier what is uh, opcodes and test underscore dub. There you go. There you go. So as you can see, we generated a ton of tests, uh, 48, which is, I, I'll explain that in a bit. Um, so this means that every single test that we run here, uh, the, uh, the execution client, in, the, in this case, because we are filling with the transition tool from Geth, we are not testing any other client here. We are just using Geth to tell us what the outcome should be. But we have a safe measure here. So if we design our test properly, it means that what we put here, it makes sense. So if we modify this, uh, let's say, uh, let, let us say this to something else, like 20 or something. And let's just run it again to see what happens. There you go. So yeah, so it's, it's not... <laughs> Yeah, the output is very, very big. So the, the thing is here that everything that we put here in the post, it's really important for us to make sure that the execution client that we are filling the test with is actually sane. Otherwise, it would go on and generate tests that will be consumed by our clients, but it will not, it will they, they will fail because the execution client that we used to fill the tests is faulty. So let's go back to the original just to make sure that we fill the test again. And there you go. OK. And um, what's the outcome of this? So we now have a new uh, a new folder. Let's see. Yeah, there you go. So we have this folder, which is called, this is the output. This is the fixtures output. And you can see that these are the three, uh, the three formats that we, that, we, uh, that we expect here. So the first one is the blockchain test, is the one that we consume by the clients, uh, the high format and the status formats. Let's just open one of them just to see how they look like. Um, there you go. So yeah, everything is here. This is the JSON output. And really nicely here, we have the name of the test, exactly what we, what we executed. And this is state test. It means that we only have one transaction in this test. And you can see it down here. So you have the transaction here. You have all the properties of the transaction. You also have the pre-state and the environment. So in this case, you can see that the environment contains simple information that comprises the block, what, what the environment will be, and, and, namely the block. Um, and you can see the number, time step, and all that stuff, and the base fee. And you can also see, more importantly, do you, do you guys remember the the address where we save our code to? This is right here. So we have address number 100. Um, and we have the code here, which is what we generated using this fancy code over here. And this is what gets executed because the, the, to, the, the to destination of the transaction is this exact same uh, address. Then the transaction goes to here executes all of this, 
and then we verify the post, which is also in this in this file. And you can see uh, one important thing is that in in the state test format, we don't verify exactly specifically every single key of the storage, but we we verify the hash, the state root. This is what gives us the the, the pass or fail of a transaction test or the of a state test. Sorry, uh, uh, when when it's consumed by the uh, by the by the by the execution client, and this is just for one test, but you can see that uh, we have many tests here in this same file, which is dub one, dub two, dub three, and so on and so forth. So in total, should be like sixteen tests, I think. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, um, <clears throat> that's basically the gist of how this framework works. I encourage everyone to just go and take a look. Um, and it's really fun to to write these tests. It's it's in Python. If you know Python before, you can use this. It's very straightforward. And yeah, let me go back to the presentation. Yeah. All right. So we have um, two other tools, very important tools. Uh, this is the Fuzzy uh, EVM. Um, currently on the execution specters, we don't generate fast a test. This is done by this tool, which is written by Marius uh, from the Go team. He wrote this tool. It's, in, it's a companionship to this other tool, which generates uh, fast code. And then you use Go EVM Lab, which is a tool that you use to one input, and then many, uh, and then you you run this input with many of the different clients. Then you check for differences. Um, it's it's it spawned a lot of bugs, and it's really useful because you can. If, when you're writing functional testing, it's really hard to really come up with every single edge case that you can think of. So this tool is a very good companionship to what we write using the execution spec tests. And also another part, important part, is the execution AP uh, testing. Um, this is done inside of this um, this repository. Um, this is let me let me just show you quickly. Basically, the all the execution API, APIs that you use to query um, the execution client, for example, get a block, get a transaction, send a transaction, all that stuff is tested in this in this uh, repository. Let me show you real quick how does that look. So we have this the repository, and then you have tests, and then you can see that you have one or two tests per each um, per each uh, per each. Uh, RPC directive. So for example, it underscore call, then you can go and see here and every single one of this is like an input and an expected output. It's very simple. Um, all of them have like this prerequisite, which is this, the chain, because um, you have to have a chain, uh, a preset chain. If you are expecting a, a fixed outcome, you have to have a genesis chain and all that and so forth. There you go. Consensus layer testing. Um, this is all done in the um, in the consensus spec repository, and the it, it, it's a, for testing specifically. It's a very similar idea to what uh, execution spec test does, which is that you have the output. Uh, is is a fixture, which the uh, the clients can consume. The one of the main differences is that. Since you have the actual specification contained in the, the same repository, you don't have to call, you don't have any dependencies. You don't depend on any consensus layer client. <clears throat> so this is very helpful because you have the tests, you have the specification, you have everything in the same, in the same repository. It's very, very, very fancy. Let me show you just um, oh, this part. So yeah, um, and if you go into the consensus specs, you go into the tests, you can go in here and see the, all the formats that um, that can be output from this repository. This, these are very many different formats that test different things of the consensus layer. It's a great deal more than we generate. Uh, for the execution specs, we only generate blockchain test format and state test, which is expected to change. We are going to introduce more, more formats as necessary. But yeah, you can see the great deal of formats that you can generate using this test. It's very useful because you can very granularly test every single th every single small layer. It's basically like unit testing every single 
uh, aspect of the of the consensus layer, and it's very efficient, also. Um, yeah. I recommend go coming into here into this repository in given or given this read because it's it's not as straightforward maybe but it's very rewarding to understand how these tests are filled. Um, yep. Let me see. Yeah. All right. So going into the last part of the a later part of the of the presentation, um, we do testing of the execution layer and consensus layer separately, but we also do <clears throat> some testing that is cross cross layer testing, uh, which is very important to know that everything uh, fits together. It's called end to end testing. Uh, it's basically just building chains from from genesis to some point and then verifying that everything all the interactions happened correctly between the execution and consensus clients we have different test, tests for this uh test suites for this i'm gonna just mention just a few of them uh because otherwise it will be a very very long presentation so we have hive which is uh, the main tool that i personally focus on and the Ethereum testing team uh, focuses on but we also have more tools that were developed uh, by the DevOps scene and also in conjunction with other uh, other other uh, companies. So we have um, the Assertor, which is basically just a tool that we uh, can use to give 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 it an input and then expect some expect uh, some expected output and assert that the output was correct in any of the chains. Give it have it being Hive. Uh, a chain, a devnet, a testnet, or even mainnet. It's 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 irrelevant. You can do them all of, all with the assertor. It's a very nice, uh, very nice tool. We also have the Cortosis uh, package, which was developed by the Cortosis team. Uh, it's a very very nice tool, which allows to do simple stuff from just spawning your own local Ethereum chain, which is comprised by the execution client or the and the consensus client, or go all the way up to even launching shell forks, which is something I will explain in a little bit. It's a very, very nice package. And it's um, I recommend it if you want to run something quick, this is this is one of the tools to go to. Um, yeah, I'm going to go a little bit more into Hive because this is uh, uh, one of also, also tools that I, I work with. So um, yeah, basically Hive is a framework that gives you gives you the tester a way of spawning tests and spawning clients inside of tests, uh, namely execution clients and consensus clients. So you can create tests that uh, just start your tests and you are you have something very specific in mind. For example, you want to test uh, the deposits in the consensus layer chain. So then you start your test and um, then you start a execution client. I'm sorry, you start first you, you start first the consensus client, then you start the execution client, you put them together, you launch some deposits into the consensus client, and then you expect something. And at the end of the test, if everything went correctly, you instruct that the test is correctly finished and passed, and then you wrap up. Uh, it's, a, it's a very nice framework for uh, doing very, very functional and specific testing. Um, you have to have in mind exactly what you want to test when you roll and write a uh, simulators. The way it works is that, let me see if I have a slide. Yeah, the way it works is um, we have the Hive server, which is the main orchestrator of everything that we run in this, but you also have simulators. The simulator's job is to know what to do um, in terms of when to start tests, how, when to end it, when to start a client, when to and the client and so on and so forth. So the first step is that you build the Hive server and I, I'll, I'll show it in a little bit. I have a demo for this. It's really, really quick. And um, you start your Hive server and you tell you start your Hive server to start a given simulator and it will go on and start a Docker container with the simulator. And basically the simulator is just another program that contains all the instructions on how to run this test. So the, the simulator starts, the simulator knows that it's running, it's being run by Hive. Then it goes goes on and does, does its thing. It starts a test, it starts a client, and then performs some calculations and things. And then it ends the client or ends the test or aborts the test or fails or passes the test. And then that's basically it. If a single simulator 
can start many tests at once in parallel, can start many, many clients in parallel also, and it can orchestrate many different uh, scenarios uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the execution and consensus clients to, to execute. Um, uh, the nice thing is that you don't have to worry uh, in your simulator on how you start up. For example, let's say, okay, I want to start a execution client, but I don't know how to start it because you know, Go Ethereum and Nethermind are started in different ways. Um, we have, for example, we have uh, uh, Docker Docker images for each, but it, it, even so, you have like parameters. For for example, Go Ethereum has a different parameter for how to specify the Genesis file or whatever, as compared when to to Nethermind. So the one of the goals of the Hive server is to abstract all of this. So you have you start your simulator, Hive tells you, okay, you have Go Ethereum, Nethermind, Pisu, and whatever, and the simulator goes into and says, okay, oh, let's start the Go Ethereum. And then it starts Go Ethereum with all the parameters already set for you. And then you can just focus on testing for that specific uh, uh, execution client. And the Hive server will start the execution or consensus clients for you. But the nice thing is that from the simulation, you can communicate to both the Hive server to start more clients, or you can connect communicate to the execution client or the consensus client directly. So it's a, it's a very nice way of just abstracting a lot of stuff away from you, the, the test writer, to only focus on the, uh, testing uh, actual things in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in each of the clients. Um, we have many simulators for, 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 the, for, for Hive. Um, they are all in Golang, and they are all contained in the Hive repository, but it's possible to write any simulator in any uh, in any uh, language that you that you need. Um, this is for the, we have also um, a library for Python, which is not out that year, uh, out, out yet, and still has some work to do, uh, some work left to do on it. Uh, but yeah, for the time being, it's only on GoLang, and as you can see, here are all the simulators that at least on master high branch that are contained into Hive. Um, and we have different things. Like, for example, we have the peer-to-peer, -peer, which is like the way of communicating execution clients in between them. So this simulator pertains to testing these, this, this part of the communication. Just start clients, communicate them with each other, and verify that this communication took place and it was correct and successful. And we also have the Ethereum uh, normal, which is con with this contains many different things, um, namely the RPC. This is the RPC compat is, um, if you guys remember this 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 other page that we, we saw, which is the execution APIs, this thing here, it goes into that repository and collects every single one of these this, uh, files and then executes them over RPC on the running clients using the, the, the method that we just, we, we just saw. So it's really important um, for for the consumption of this uh, of, of these tests to use Hive uh, only for the for the RPC compat. Um, but we also have more more things. For example, we have the um, uh, consensus. This this loads uh, tests from Ethereum tests and just passes them into the, into the client, verifies them. We also have the engine API. Which this is very important because it tests the communication from the consensus client into the into the execution client via the engine API, which is defined over here in the execution APIs. And uh, the important part of this simulator is that it does not use a consensus client. And the reason is that it wants to test some very specific sequence of engine API commands um, and some very specific uh, Genesis properties. Uh, so the reason, uh, the, 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 the way that we do that with is, and without the interruption of the consensus client, um, it's by generating a mock uh, consensus, consensus client, which is basically just does the engine API calls that we exactly require. We also have the GraphQL, which tests the GraphQL. The PySpec is the basically execution spec test. They are all consumed over here and some sync tests also. Um, and but also um, very important is the F2. Uh, this is a legacy name, <laughs> don't mind it. Um, this contains the all the the interrupt testing between the uh, the consensus layer and the execution layer. 
So this actually, this one, this 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 simulators over here, simulators over here, do actually spawn a consensus client and an execution client at the same time. And this purpose is just to test some specific scenarios that are happening. For example, in Cancun, you have blobs, blobs sending blobs and doing the blob stuff and uh, verifying that the consensus client and the execution client behave the way expected uh, when these blobs are fed into them. And it's very nice because it orchestrates both things, both both the execution client and the consensus client at the same time. Uh, and it's uh, really nice to see how it works. Um, yeah. Let me see. What else? Most, uh, a smoke and portal, more, more simulators, different implementations. This is a different implementation. It uses different Ethereum clients, but it's the same idea. Uh, yeah. Yeah. OK, so let me just quickly just I just want to show a little bit of how it runs. It's really, really simple. Um, one of the important parts is that you first have to clone the repository, as always. Um, just go over here into Hive, Ethereum Hive, git clone. You clone it into, into your, your, to your uh, local uh, host. And then assuming that you have Golang installed, you can just go build it and you will be building Hive, which is this executable right here. That right there. So this, this executable pertains to this, um, this server over here, the server that we uh, that orchestrate everything. It's basically a very fancy Docker container instantiator and orchestrator. That's its role. Um, so let's, let's run a, a simple test. I think I have something in the, there you go. Yeah. Okay, let's let's run a simple test um, that is um, just the testnet test for an execution client and and a consensus client. Let me just. Oh, oh I hope it's not that bad. Okay, so um, we're gonna use the Hive command. Um, let me just. We're gonna use the Hive command, and we're gonna instruct it to use three different clients. So the first client is the Netherman client, which is the execution client that we want to use. And the second and third command uh, and third clients are both part of the consensus layer, but um, but they have two different responsibilities. Um, Hive requires a beacon node and a validator client to be run for the consensus layer part. So that's where we specify in here. It's Prism in this case, and we're using beacon node just the, the beacon node part of Prism, and then validator client, the validator client client part of Prism. Then we're going to specify a simulator, which is this, this flag over here. And then we are going to use E2 Denkun, which is the latest um, simulator that we have. And we're going to limit this to just a single, uh, let me see, just, no, um, me. OK, if you want to know the names, of the of the actual uh, tests that we're running, you can go into the simulator and just get, for example, let's go to Ed2 and let's go to Denkun and let's look at the suites. Um, you can actually look look at here. It's the it will list all of the all of the all of the tests that are currently running on this on this simulator. And let's go to the easiest one, which is um, the the Devnet testnet, uh, De Denkun testnet. Um, and you can see that every single test case in here will have a specific common line that you can just copy paste. And let me just do that. Uh, this dash is not important. This can be removed. And let's just copy paste it here. And let's just hit enter to see what happens. The first thing that happens is that, OK, a Hive starts, and, the hi and it builds something that is called Hive proxy. And uh, this is not important. It's basically just like an intermediary between the execution clients and the consensus clients and the Hive server. Uh, the second thing that is building over here, let's, oh, I cannot pass it well. Um, the second thing that is building is the execution client. You can see that Nethermind is being built here and it built correctly. Um, and it, it it's important to build clients because you can know that building will give you the latest version that we are uh, trying to test. So in this case, we are pulling Nethermind, the latest master. So also, it might contain bugs because this is, this is not a release. This is a master. So there are things, obviously, in the master branch of each client that can contain 
uh, bugs. But this is the purpose of Hive, to, to catch that, those, those errors. So the important thing here is use the, the latest master. The, the next things that are building is the same thing for the consensus client, the consensus layer, sorry. We are using Prism, the Bitcoin node, the Prism, the, the validator claim, same thing. We're using the latest master, which is not a release. It's, post, it's, it's something newer. It's basically just a, a beta version. So, um, so there could be bugs in this. And lastly, we're going to build the simulator. So the simulator in here is the one that we specified. But this, this flag here that we use, which is the limit, is, is a flag that is going into the simulator. So we're passing that flag into simulator to tell it, tell it to please do not run anything else but this specific, specific test. So it's not going to run the entire simulator. And the dark capability uh, of testing of that simulator is, gonna, is just going to run this one single test. And now it's running. And you can see that it started several things. And it's currently running because, because it's doing its thing in the background. But we can what we can see right now, it's very silly, is that we have all of these things running in Docker. So you can see that we have spawned two different execution clients and two different uh, um, validator and bacon out clients for the consensus layer. This The reason is that since this is a full testnet, that we are using, and uh, normally the consensus clients require at least one peer to know that everything is sane, right? Because otherwise, um, you 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 don't if you don't have any single peer to connect to, you, that means you are you are something is wrong is happening. So in this case, we instantiate two pairs of everything and let the simulator do its thing, and then we can actually go into the into the file. There's a simulator log file that we can use just to see. The main output of this is uh, the logs um, the, the, in, the, in the workspace. So in your local host, in high, in your, the high folder that you have, when you run your work, workspace, you will see these logs directory. And, the, and if you come in here, you will see that the output of the actual simulator. So you will see everything that is happening um, in, in the simulator, what it's running, what it's doing, what it's requesting. Everything you will see it here. This is just a Genesis file. But then you can see here that the chain is progressing. So you can see that the simulator, one of the, the jobs that it does, does is just to um, keep track of everything that is happening. So the first thing that it keeps track is that the chain is actually progressing. So you can see that we are jumping from one slot to the next one. So four, five, the chain is changing, the, the head chain is changing. It means that blocks are being produced. And in the meantime, also there's a lot of testing in the background, which is sending blob transactions, uh, verifying those blob transactions that they go inside, and 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 everything is fine. Um, this is, I think, it's a lengthy test because it waits for finalization. So we're gonna wrap it there for the demo. Otherwise, it's gonna take too long. Um, but yeah, that's uh, basically the, the gist for for have. Let me just cancel this. And I think there's only five minutes left. <laughs> And so I, is, are, are there any questions yet or should I just keep going? Yeah, let's, let's uh, take a second for questions, I guess, because it's been, a, it's been a lot, Mario. Thank you so much, by the way, it's amazing. Yes, yeah, uh, I love the live session and everything, really great. Um, yeah, back to, back to that, actually, there was a one interesting question I wanted to ask um, because the um, execution spec tests uh, have a, as dependency the get uh, execution environment. So the question is like, uh, and, and you touched on it a little, bit, a little bit, but maybe if you can elaborate, like, so like how, like we, I guess we don't assume that there is no bug in get. So like, how do you identify if there is a actually bug in the dependency and yeah, how do we work with that? So yeah, ideally, the, the ideal situation is that we don't depend on Geth. That's that's the truth. Um, so for f as a workaround with that, we are working for to have a another execution client which is just specs oriented, which is called ILS, is execution specs a, a repo. Um, ideally, we should not use Geth, but now uh, as as of now, we do depend on Geth, and that the reason and and the reason why it's not. It's not is is not a big deal. Is because we gener we also verify the results of the post state. So we have to be very careful when we write a test that we actually verify everything that we expect. 
The only thing that we don't go into detail is the gas consumption because it's really tricky to get it right in the testing. And it can get um, to false positives and it can get a lot of noise. But other things, which is the keys of the storage, the values, all of that, we actually uh, verify them when we get the response from Geth. So there's no much leeway for, for bugs uh, affecting us in get we from time to time we do get we do find bugs in get when we are filling tests and we then we go report it and we have to wait until the get team fixes those um for us to be able to generate uh the tests and in some other rare occasions we also we have generated the, the full um the full test we have we have the fixture and then we go and run it on other clients and then we get an error and then sometimes is most of the times is an error with the other client, but sometimes it has happened in the past that we found a bug in Geth that the other client uh, found. So it's yeah, it's it's it's, it's a stepped process as, as of now. It will get better in the future, but as of now, there are some places that it's it's we have to be very careful where where we where what where we what we verify what we uh, what what we let pass. Um, for example, the gas limits is very tricky, and as I said. That's something that we let the other clients verify for us. But yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for explaining that. Um, another question is like more um, an advice for like an EIP author, for example, who implements some change to RPC method, which doesn't need to change like the state transition or anything, just like, for example, add some extra data in RPC response. What would be a way to test this, like to compare the outputs of different implementations, for example, what is you know, something that um, is, yeah, doesn't have much overhead? So if I if I understood correctly, um, so the RPC is something that you can test without um, going into writing the test that we just described. So for that the scenario, you would go into execution app is repository, uh, which is the the part that I uh, just glance upon uh, a, little, a little bit, uh, which is the um, uh, where the RPC uh, tests live. Uh, those RPC uh, tests they are very very self-contained, very small, and easy to write. Um, for for those specific kind of VIPs, I would I would suggest going on onto the execution APIs repository, just giving it a look. Uh, giving a look at the tests, what we test here. So if you have something to introduce to the RPC of the Ethereum clients, this is the place to start, I think, the execution APIs repository. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, one one question, going back to your example there, the demo that you did, um, there was uh, the tests for the opcodes, um, which was 48 test cases, which is like three per opcode. So like, what were the cases where we have like 48, 48 uh, uh, test cases there? Definitely. So we have we have this six, 16 uh, opcodes, but for each one of those, we generated the three, the three test formats. So the state test format, the blockchain test format, and the blockchain test hive, hive format. So every every single one of the formats has its own purpose. State test is very self-contained, just one transaction in and and in the the pre-state out the state route check that's it, the blockchain test which is the what the, the clients consume they can consume it just check that the, the block header everything passes and lastly the hive test, which contains everything like everything that comes as if it was coming from the consensus layer so that's why we have three different test formats uh, to consume and to generate. Get it? I get it in, in the the old formats. Cool, cool, cool. awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, one uh, yeah one more question maybe we can combine these like uh, what is what do you find the most complex to test in EL or CL what is the most heavy and how much time it actually takes to run all these tests like for example to test the Cancun mm -hmm. Um I would say it really depends on the so for the first question what's the most complex I think the interoperability is something that is not pretty much solved yet. And uh, this is the most complex part, in my opinion. Um, the the EVM part is also complex, but in in its own way, there there are a lot of nuances that you have to be aware when you're writing an EVM test. It always happens that oh, I forgot about this thing of the EVM, that this side effect in the EVM somewhere else, and it affected my test. So it's you really have to. Uh, 
well, you, you cannot know everything of the EVM, but it's like a back and forth and go and check and specifications, the yellow paper and everything. So it's a very, very long process. It's like, it's, it's, it's really nice because it's rewarding. Once you have your EVM test completed and finalized and it works, it's really nice because you know that everything is correct, uh, but it's complex indeed. It's, it's, it's time consuming. Um, and the other part, uh, how much does it take? It takes a lot. So depending on the so the hardware that we're running on, um, we the problem with the consensus test, the EVM test, is that every single test instantiates a full client, and then you give it the input, and then you expect the output. So it's very time consuming. So I think there are up to ten thousand or something tests in the Ethereum test repository. In the new execution specs, there are only five thousand. Um, so it takes a lot less and we can parallelize those. So I'm not, I don't have the number, but last time I tested, it wasn't so long, maybe five minutes to 10 minutes or something for the execution spec test in parallelize. If you have a beefy hardware, otherwise it's going to take a long time. Oh yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. That's very interesting. Um, yeah. The next questions are about like, how do you communicate bugs to client teams? Uh, I guess it's different from your perspective as a as a testing team, but also like you mentioned that we will get to the bug bounties part. So maybe I'll let you like segue into that. Uh, this, this is very important. Yeah, it depends. It really depends on the severity of the of the bug. If we found found something that affects any live network, it's going to be something that is very. We have to be very cautious. Uh, normally, when when we are developing a new fork, for example, we we were started. When we were at the start of Cancun, um, it's it's really easy. It's just like submit an issue and, and something because there, there's no live network with Cancun at that point. So it doesn't really matter. But the, 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 the closer that we get to Cancun being released in any live network, the more cautious that we have to be uh, when we submit uh, issues. It gets to the point where we only communicate this to the specific developers and we get uh, to specific uh, communication there's and there's there's special handling that you have to take care of when we're submitting uh, something that is potentially harmful for a live network um, yeah cool, cool, cool. Um, awesome thank you so much I think we are out of the questions if uh, there are none like still feel free to ask we are we are over time yeah we should we should wrap yeah. it up I actually have a little, uh, couple more slides. I can just fly yeah, go ahead. <laughs> through that. Feel free. If we, you know, we we are all very happy following. Like we, everybody's excited. So like, feel free to use our time. Just you know, mind your own time. So how much? How, how however? How much? No problem. Take, yeah. Go ahead. No, let's let, let's 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 carry on. I, I will just fly over the the, the slides. Um, so yeah, after. Everything else that I explained uh, before, we still have another test um, um, methodology to use, is which is the live uh, test nets. We have the dev nets, the shadow forks, and the public dev nets, which all happen before before uh, the mainnet release. Um, so for Cancun, uh, mainnet is co is coming up in three days. So all of this has already passed, and we have many iterations of all of this this different uh, test nets. The first one is the devnet. It's something that is like we have all we run a small chain with all the combinations of the clients, but it's a very very li limited size of clients. So we have very few nodes per each uh, chain, and the purpose of this is to test a a, a new coming uh, a new proof of concept uh, uh, fork. Uh, for example, at the very start of the, of, of the blobs, which was almost two years ago, I think, uh, DevNets is the first way to go. You launch, uh, you, you implement the bare minimum, uh, the function in the birth concept for each of the clients, and then you launch a testnet, a DevNet with this. And then you see, you, you, you send things into the chain and see how it uh, behaves, and you verify the behavior. And obviously, this is, this is where, when the software is very not ready, for production, so these are very short-lived, and normally they go down and they go out of sync, and a lot of bad things happen. But that's what they are for. And another thing that we use is the shell forks. This is a very clever implementation that the DevOps team has come up with. It's basically you have a clone of mainnet, but 
on a limited set of nodes, you configure them to activate the upcoming fork early. So for example, in the case of Cancun, we sync everything, but um, this this shadow forks be, began happening um, early la uh, last year uh, from June, I think. So the, the clients that we were running were configured, for example, June 20th of 20, 2023, uh, go on with Cancun. And then you, you sync and you wait for the fork to happen. You verify things. And the, the nice thing about this is that you can still communicate to the existing uh, nodes. So you can get transactions from the live network. So while you are testing your new functionality, you are still getting some information, some transactions from the from, from actual activity in the mainnet. Um, so a very nice way to test, uh, mainly with blobs. This was used a lot. And lastly, the public testnets, um, which, ha which have been uh, girly, which is now deprecated. Um, we have Sepolia and Holesky. They both serve different um, different purposes. And um, yeah, it, mostly this is for applications to be, for them to be able to test their implementations on the new functionality of the, uh, of, 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 of the fork. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I'm just gonna go very quickly through Ethereum security. Um, there's, there's an Ethereum security um, a group in, in, in the Ethereum Foundation. They are very dedicated to all of these specific issues. Mainly they test, or they also perform tests, which um, go into, for example, the analysis of these attacks and all of that stuff, that complex stuff that becomes a security issue. They are uh, the, the, the people that are best suited to uh, respond to most of the questions that you could have about security. But I'm gonna go over it a little bit. Um, the main things that can go wrong in the execution layer side, for example, is that um, when a client um, does like invalidates a block that fully complies with the Ethereum specification, uh, this means that I, I have block that is correct. And then my client, for some reason, decided that it was not correct. And then it just rejects it. That means that all of, all of the people running that client, that specific client, are going to go out of sync with the network and are going into a fork. Um, there are a lot of variables and many things will happen depending on the weight of the distribution of how many people are running that actual client. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail, but this is one of the, part, the, the, the possible things. Um, also the other thing can happen. So you have a valid, uh, this is a little bit worse to be honest. Um, this is when your client receives a block that is invalid and you uh, pass it as valid. This is worse because you are validating something that is out of specification that is very risky. Um, it is, this is something that we take a special care on when we are designing a, a test uh, inside of the uh, test repository. Also, another example is the uh, denial service when, during block execution. Um, if a client just takes a transaction or a block and it just takes so much time to execute, that could be also deemed like a denial service. It's another possible security concern that we can have. Um, on the consensus layer side, something mm, different is that depending on the on the faulty node, faulty nodes that you have, for example, you have less than thirty two percent of the uh, of the clients that are misbehaving, and then I, they are not following the Ethereum consensus specification for any reason. Um, it less than thirty two percent is the least uh, concerning. Um, scenario. So you can miss slots and your chain will miss some some attestations. You will have, see some hiccups, but nothing will happen. And the chain will still finalize. So everything carries on as if nothing happened. If you have 33 or more percent of the majority, you can cause, um, if the client fails, you can cause a delay finality. So what happens is that the chain, if there's a split and 32% of the client of the clients go through this route, it means that they, the the main chain will not finalize. So that's that's bad, but it's uh, very recoverable. It's, it's 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 not as bad as 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 other. Um, fifty percent or more, you can disrupt the fork choice. It means that you have 50 50, 50 percent of the nodes. Then you will not uh, you will disrupt how the, the clients behave and how the clients choose what uh, chain to follow. Um, 
depending on what the majority of client is. And you have the last and the most concerning one is the 66% or more percent of the fault clients. This means that you have a super majority of clients failing because of the same thing, which means that they can finalize the chain. This is the most risky behavior that we can find in security related concerns. Um, it's very bad. Uh, it's It probably will require uh, intervention of some sort. Um, at the moment, I don't think I, I'm capable of explaining what will happen in that in that scenario, but it's one of the things that we'll always have to consider. Um, that's why we do so much testing before um, before any even considering launching to mainnet. And we have the back one team. If you guys like this, you like you you guys like security, you have uh, a, 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 an eye for to finding. Uh, security concerns in software. This is a place where you can shine. Uh, you go into the bounty, bounty uh, Ethereum.org and then you can get a nice bounty if you find something that can clearly and, and in the, indeed can disrupt the, 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 the live networks. And you, to get an example of all the public previous public disclosures that have happened in the past, you can go into this repository, which contains actual uh, documented uh, security issues that have happened, um, that have been disclosed, sorry, um, in the past, but not in hit mainnet because there was bounty and there they were dis privately dis disclosed. Uh, the main encouragement of this slide is do not try to, if you find something that you think got disrupt, go into here, you will receive a bounty um, and uh, you will uh, not harm the network in any way. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's like a white hat. Um, situation. And that's basically it. That's my presentation. If you have any questions, um, these are my handles, Twitter, GitHub. Um, if you guys are interested in testing, just hit me up. I will answer more questions if you have them. Thank you so much again, Mario. Uh, amazing stuff. Um, yeah. Let me check if uh, we have some closing questions, but I think we are we are good, man, because we are like 15 minutes over, and you've dedicated a lot of great time to us. You you, you gave us a lot, man. Uh, I think people will have to also see the presentation again to catch all the details there. Uh, man, uh, it was intense, it was long, so I really appreciate your time. Uh, it was really great. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I also learned a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, um, maybe uh, maybe uh, if you could point uh, people who want to like learn and start contributing in some meaningful way, what would be the one place you point them to? Mm, we need help in any of the repositories that you have seen in this this um, presentation. Whatever picks your interest the most, I think that's the best place that you can start with. Anything is welcome. Mm -hmm. And you can start also, all the repositories have the, um, normally the publish issues with a first good issue uh, tag. That's the place to start in each of the repositories. I'll make sure to, because um, we have the execution spec that we, that we uh, uh, maintain. I will make sure that after this, we will try to think of many first good new issues to set them in the execution spec test if you want to go there. Or you have also, I will make sure that um, something new pops up. Amazing, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much again. Uh, it was really great to have like uh, Mario Tandem here in the APSG, so uh, it's, it, was, it was fun. And uh, I think, yeah, we will, we will wrap it up. Um, yeah, also like you are in the Discord, uh, uh, in the Discord server, so um, uh, if people bother you there, uh, please excuse, but they might have some extra questions, I guess. Uh, yeah, thank you so much again. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much for all of the people who've been following, asking questions. It's been it's been an uh, intense one. So uh, I'll see you guys um, next week. Yeah. Ciao. And, thank uh, you. Yeah. Have a great day, Mario. Thank you so much again. Bye bye.